precious. You're precious to us, Lord. It's uh, kind of ironic to say, Jesus, that your blood is precious, Lord, but but in that same breath, we have to admit that without your death and the cross, we are nothing. And without your resurrection, we are nothing. We're just, you know, here as, as strangers, Lord, but because of you, Jesus, because of your work at that cross, at your work, your life, and the fact that you took it all on that cross, we can boldly come to the Father. We can boldly ask and, and, and know that we're being heard. We can walk with you, Jesus. We can speak to you. You speak to us. Thank you, Christ our King. During these uncertain times, we know that you are here and that you are working here, not only in this church, Lord, but in this city, in this county, in this country, Lord. Let me pray for all those who couldn't make it here this morning for whatever reason, where they're quarantined or they have sickness, Lord, or they just couldn't make it this morning. They're watching online, Lord. May they sense the very presence of your Holy Spirit just like we do here. May you continue to open our hearts as well as theirs to understand, to see, to draw near, to worship you, our, our King, our glorious King. Lord, we, we know you are here and your presence is felt, Lord. We thank you for, for yourself, for your presence. It's in your name, Jesus, that, that all of us with one voice together, online and on site, say, Amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. So glad you're here this morning to worship with us. So glad that you decided to, to worship our King, whether you're here on site or you're watching online. We are delighted that you are pressing in during a season that I think most people are not kind of drawing in. And so uh, super proud of you for making that effort to connect with the Lord, to connect with this, his family, and, and to be here this morning. Most of us have heard the expression, don't blink or you'll miss it, right? Normally, it's an expression that you use when you are going down a road and you have this small little town. Now, for us here in Gonzales, it's not that difficult to think of the small towns, is it? You're going down the road and don't blink or you'll miss, what, Belmont, right? Don't blink or you'll miss Leesville. Don't blink or you'll miss, you know, whatever small town, Yorktown, right? And we tell our kids that because why? It's a small town. It happens so fast when you're passing by. In some cases, we use don't blink or you'll miss it when we're watching a show or a, or a movie. There's something that you know, you know, we know that there's something that's going to happen that will change the plot line that if you just miss that one part, you're going to miss the whole movie. And so we tell our kids, don't blink or you'll miss it. Well, this morning, we're going to go through five verses, and Mark is going to go through these five different situations or stages in life, these events, and he's going to go through it really, really quick. And so we got to stop here for just a moment so that we won't miss it. And so rather than just go through three events rather quickly like Mark does, what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to pause for just a moment and, and explore each event so that we can get the richness of who God is and what he's doing in those three events. We're going to get some rich theology today. Now, theology, simply put, is, is our understanding of God. Whatever view, everybody here is a theologian. Whatever, whenever you think about God, you're being a theologian. You're thinking about God. And so today we're going to spend some time to think about God through these different events, so we're going to slow it down, just like you slow it down when you're going through a small town, and it's like, you're like, let me slow it down so we can see this one house in this town or whatever, you know? So we're going to slow it down here for just a moment. Now, if you joined us last week, we saw that we're going to go through this book of uh, Mark, the book of Mark, or the gospel of Mark, which I like to call the discipleship gospel. And I believe it's a, it's a, a gospel that is presenting Jesus as the discipler of these people he's recruiting, his disciples, and then showing them how to disciple other disciples, how to bring others to follow Jesus and then disciple them along the way. So we're going to see that that ends up being the outline for the book. Jesus, the discipler. Jesus Christ is presented by Mark as the suffering servant, as the son of God. 
in whom you have to make a decision whether you're going to follow him or you're going to reject him. You're going to follow him and, and, and follow his ways and his words and his works or are, are the people that are coming to hear him, are they just going to say, you know what, no thank you, I just want to see the miracles. So that's what we're going to see over the course of the next couple of, mo- uh, a couple of months as we're in this book. But as we prepare ourselves, I want to give a couple of definitions, or at least one of them today. And this really, this definition of disciple making doesn't really come out until next week. But this, this is the way disciple making uh, is being defined. And that is, disciple making is an intentional relationship. To walk alongside someone who has been invited to regularly follow Jesus, living out his ways, his words, and his works. Matter of fact, that's the definition that the staff, we've been working on that for at least a year or two years now. I said two years now, just kind of working, kicking around. What's a good way to define disciple making? And as we've looked at the book of Mark and as I've pressed in and look at that, this is the definition that comes out. It's, it's this intentional relationship. Jesus intentionally gets into relationship with a few disciples. And then he invites them to come alongside of him to follow him. It is an invitation in each occasion to follow him and to walk alongside with him. So it's not just a uh, come hear me preach. It's this we're going to walk in life together for the next three years. So it's a walk alongside someone who's been invited to regularly follow Jesus. It's not a one and done, but they're regularly going to try and follow Jesus. And what that's going to look like is following his his ways, the way he approaches things, his words, what he is saying and his works, what he is doing. And so that's what we're going to see for the for the next couple of months is how does that unfold? How does that play itself out? But today we're going to look at these three events from a slow down version. And then at the end, I'm going to give you three very practical takeaways from today's uh, text. And so go to Mark chapter 1, verse 9. So if you brought your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 1, verse 9, or you have your version Bible, go ahead and, and open it and, and go there. And don't worry, I'm not going to be thinking, oh man, he's asleep, he's playing Candy Crush, or she's playing Candy Crush. I'm going to assume that you're engaging in the Word of God as you open your phone. So go to Mark chapter 1, verse 9. Get your holy glow. For those of you who have a phone, it's a holy glow. And for for some of you, it's the the holy word. You're opening your Bible. So go to verse 9. Here's the passage. It says, "One, One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. Verse 10, as Jesus came up out of the water... He saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove, not a dove, but like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son. And you bring me great joy. Or you, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. It's another way of uh, saying it, a different translation in the NIV. Verse 12, it says, the spirit then compelled Jesus, the same word that is used when Jesus compels demons out of people. The spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals and angels took care of him. So let's slow it down here for just a moment. And let's look at each event Like with with this microscope. And the first event is this. A closer look to the first event is this. Jesus was baptized by John. Jesus was baptized by John. This is a big, big deal. Because Because it was Jesus' way of identifying with us. And what I want you to understand is a couple of things. I want you to understand what the difference between John's baptism and our baptism is. And I want you to understand... Why Jesus was baptized. Why did Jesus get baptized? So I want, you, I want us to understand the differences there. So in order to do that, let's go first with the, the baptism of John. John's baptism. John's baptism is a statement of repentance. A public statement of repentance. In order to be forgiven. 
So, so when John is baptizing, it's a statement that people are making to the world around them, to their community. It's a public statement saying, I am repenting not only, not only of the way I think about God, but I'm repenting about what my lifestyle is all about in order to be forgiven. Now, a couple of things we have to understand. The first one is that John is preparing the way for Jesus, who's going to do a different type of baptism. It's going to be called baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But he, he's preparing the way of Jesus just in the same way that somebody during that era would have been preparing the way for an emperor as the emperor is coming to town. As the emperor is coming to the city, the messenger would have gone before him, would have shared with the community or the city or the region that the emperor is coming, prepare the roads, prepare the path. Because there's going to be a lot of people coming and prepare the resources as well because the emperor is coming. So they could prepare for a celebration when, when he would finally get there. So in a very similar way, John the Baptist is saying, hey, we need you to prepare your life. The road that you're heading into because who you're going to see in just a moment, is the, the Messiah we've been waiting for a long, long time. Sure, God has been silent for 400 years, but now he has spoken and, and we're seeing, we're going to see this Messiah. Prepare your hearts. Change your minds and your ways. What are they changing their minds about? That's really, really important. What are they changing their minds about? They're going to be changing their minds about who God is. Who God is. Because during that time, during that time, the Jewish community had gotten so invested into the Jewish way of, of religion and religiosity and the way of worshiping God that the way to God became the way. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this, is that, that for them to be Jewish was to be saved. That the system of religion they had and all the practices that were associated with it, you know, the sacrifices, the, you know, the going to the temple, the laws that, that were contained in the, in, in the scriptures, but also the, the interpretations of the law. That all those things replaced, it replaced their faith in God. They were putting their faith on religion, not on God. Now, oftentimes we think this, when we think about the Jewish community, in our minds, we tend to think that salvation in that time in the Old Testament or before Jesus, that it was by works. And I want to tell you here this morning that it wasn't. It wasn't by works. It was never intended to be by works. It was by faith in God. That's the way Abraham started it, right? You know, before any law was d d delivered, before anything was out there, it was faith in God. Your relationship with God. And out of that relationship, then you would do the rest. Then you would do the laws. You would follow the commands. Those were expressions of a relationship with God. But so many years, have, so many decades and centuries have passed that people now think, no, no, no. What it means to be a follower of God is to show up to the synagogue. It's to do all these things, all these check marks. And John the Baptist comes into the scene and is saying, You've got it wrong. In verse 4 to 5, in, in the same chapter, it says, This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness, and he preached that people should be baptized. Why? To show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, again, Jewish, the Jewish community is responding, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins... He baptized them in the Jordan River. So they're repenting publicly, and their sins are being forgiven. Now, I want you to understand a couple of things. One thing is this. We think, oh, the Jewish community was so excited to see John the Baptist, because we get excited, right? We read the text, and we're like, oh, this should have been really, they were probably were really excited. Well, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were not excited to see John. They hated John. They disliked them. They thought that he was trying to rattle their Jewish way of living and the system of worship. 
And, and, and that intimidated them, and they felt he was being, like, just non-biblical, and so, but they couldn't do anything about it because John had a following. The truth that he was communicating was resonating with people, and because it was resonating with people, people, particularly sinners, were coming and hearing him out. And they were responding by repenting of what they thought they thought God was. But in addition to that, the, the teachers and the Pharisees, you know why they were angry? Because the people you baptized were Gentiles, people that weren't Jewish, that they didn't have a Jewish blood in them. You baptized those heathens, the, the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, right? Those are the ones that need repentance. And, and, and that was the way you would baptize people. If somebody who was not a Jew wanted to have the Jewish faith, they would get baptized, you know, submerged in the water, brought out, and then they would be in the Jewish faith. And so the Jewish people were like, well, why are we supposed to be baptized? We, we are Jews. Now, let me put it in a different perspective. It's like uh, cultural Christianity, the cultural Christian. It's like the Christian who's like, man, I, you ask him, why, why are you— you're a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Of course, I go to church. And so the qualifying thing of why they're a Christian is because they go to church, you know. I regularly go to church. Not only that, I give my tithing, you know. I'm pretty good about that. I serve. I've prayed a prayer. And we have all these che- check marks in here. And so when you ask the individuals, like, you know, are you a Christian? Yeah, of course, I go to church. But what you don't hear is, I put my faith in Jesus. I follow Jesus. And so when you see somebody who's like, oh, I, of course I'm a Christian. You know, I grew up a Christian. I grew up a, a Protestant or a Catholic or whatever. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're placing your faith where? You're placing it in your religion? Okay, oh, no. You're placing it in what you do then. Right? And it's, that's not the case. We place it on a, on a person, on Jesus. And so... The Jewish community at this time, it's like they were bumper sticker Jews. No disrespect. Which, one, which was they're doing the things that you would think a, a good Jew would do, just like a good Christian would do, right? But all the while, all the while, they're putting their faith either in their religion or they're putting their faith in nothing. And so they're living like, like there's no tomorrow. And that's what John is confronting during this time. And that's why when he baptizes it's a public proclamation of people saying like hey i'm repenting of what i think who 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 god is but also of my ways and as they confess then they get forgiven and so having asked that why did jesus get baptized then if it's a way of repentance if it's a way of saying i am in in the wrong about what i think about god and, and about my lifestyle why would jesus get baptized let me offer you two, two, two reasons. The first one is this. Jesus did it in the beginning of his ministry. So listen, Jesus got baptized in the beginning of his ministry. Even though John said, no, 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 I can't baptize you. Don't you know that you're you? You're supposed to baptize me. And, John, and, and Jesus is like, no, 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 you must baptize me, you know. Why? Because at the beginning of his ministry, what he's doing is he's identifying with our sin. He's def- identifying with us in our sin. He doesn't have sin, but he's identifying with us. And because of that, it's the bookmark. It's where it starts. Like he's identifying with hu- sinful human humanity. He's identifying with the sinner, although he has no sin. And then at the end, at the end of the bookmark, where he dies and resurrects. When he's at the cross, he's identifying with our sin and saying, I will take your sin. I will take the fury of God for you. But he starts it off with baptism. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, it says that he, that's exactly what he's doing. He was identifying himself with sinners. And in response, and in response, they will be identifying with him as forgiven sinners. Let me say that again. He identifies himself with sinners, and in response, they would be identifying with him as forgiven sinners. I've mentioned this story probably a couple of times, especially when we get to baptisms, and that's the, you know, 
back when I was in my mid-20s. I know what you're thinking. But you're in your 20s, Jesse. I'm not in my 20s. You flatter me. No, I'm not in my 20s. I'm already in my 40s. But when I was in my 20s and I was going through seminary, taking all these classes, studying to be a pastor, my mentor at the time, the guy that was discipling me, uh, was a Messianic Jew, uh, Hirsch Schizever. Very golly man. He was older than I was. He was probably in his 40s back then. Uh, so he had two decades in front of me. And uh, he put his faith, after having studied like the, 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 the Jewish way, he grew up in the synagogue, he studied, he, he knew Hebrew. Uh, he didn't have to study much for the Hebrew class like I did. And when he put his faith in Christ, he was rejected by his family. Didn't want anything to do with him. He, because that's not the way to stop it. That's not how you understand God. And so they, they, they just rejected him, and they, the rejection went, went further when he married a non-Jewish woman. And he was a Messianic Jew. He loved the Lord. And I still remember right as he was graduating, and uh, we were both graduating, he was having a baptism in his house with his small group at his pool. He said, man, come, come join us. I was like, yeah, man, that'd be awesome. And then he asked me, hey, have you been baptized as an adult? I was like, no, man, I got baptized as a little child. I mean, I grew up Catholic. And <clears throat> he was like, man, you, you really should get baptized as an adult. And I was like, okay. And I said, think about it. You're going to be asking people to get baptized, but you yourself haven't gotten baptized? And I was like, well, when you put it that way. What was he saying? He was saying, you know, if you're going to be calling people to baptism, but you haven't been baptizing, what kind of example you're showing? So here Jesus is showing the example. He's showing the way right from the very beginning. He's showing the example. Not because he has sin, but he's showing that example, and he will be the first of many. And he was like that, stake in the ground saying, when you get baptized, it's because of him. So why, why do we do baptism as believers this is, this is the reason. Our baptism is a public statement, is a public statement of following Jesus because we've been forgiven. Does that make sense? It's a public statement. You're saying publicly, I am a Christ follower. That's where I, I'm anchoring my belief in, in that person, Jesus. Not on religion, not on the things that I do, not on, not on what I can earn, not on my works. I'm placing it on Jesus. And I want to demonstrate to the world that I've been forgiven. It's not to be forgiven. It's because you're forgiven. And that's why I tend to challenge you guys to, to get baptized. Because when you do that, you're identifying yourself with his death, his burial, his death, and his resurrection. is an image and a picture of that. It's like um, I mentioned this several times now, you know, through the course of many years. And it's like wearing a ring when you're married. You know, if I take my ring and go to the store, I'm not unmarried, right? The ring is a symbolic, uh, si it's a symbol that's very symbolic of the commitment I made to Marisa, that I'd be faithful to her. And so the ring shows that. But if I take the ring off, it doesn't mean that I'm unmarried. It doesn't mean like, woohoo, man, I don't got the ring. I get to do whatever I want to do now. It doesn't work that way. Why? Because the ring the ceremony is a public pro, uh, profession, proclamation to the world that there's a commitment that is made to her. In the same way, when we make that invitation when, when, uh, to invite Christ in our life and he's in our life, guess what happens? He changes your heart. And when he does that, you want to show it publicly. Now, I didn't mention that the Holy Spirit, what's the role of the Holy Spirit? Jesus, we saw last week, would come with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It'd be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus came for. What was that? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, simply put, is the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart that is dead to quicken it so that your heart now is able to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior that he is in your life. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which leads me to this. There's two errors we tend to make with, with baptism. The first one is this. Is to think, is to think that that if we die and we go before Jesus, that God is gonna send us to hell in a technicality. 
That's an error. To think that, that somehow, like if I die and go before the Lord, the Lord's going to be like, man, like you did put your faith in me, but you didn't get baptized. It's a technicality, man. Sorry. Prepare the furnace. You know, like th- that's not going to happen, folks. Like, because baptism is not for your salvation. It's because you're saved that you get baptized. That, does that make sense? Am I making myself uh, clear here? That when you get baptized, and, and even if you don't get baptized as an adult, when you go before the Lord, is he's not going to be like, oh, man, you're busted. Man, you thought you were going to get away with this, and you didn't. And, you know, naughty, naughty, naughty. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Because you're not doing it to be forgiven. John's baptism, right? The other thing that we tend to, to believe about baptism that, that is not biblical is the idea that the Holy Spirit comes to you at baptism. Now, I know a lot of times the reference points are like, well, you, we see the ministry of Jesus and the, the, Bapti- the, the John the Baptist disciples didn't really get it because they didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then we see some of it in the New Testament. But that was during the time where it, it wasn't clear in the style that the Holy Spirit was doing what he was doing, which is changing the hearts of people you don't get the holy spirit when you're baptized by the holy spirit you're baptized by the holy spirit he changes you and then you do baptism is that clear in other words there's nothing that necessarily special that happens when you're immersed underwater and come out that somehow that's when the baptist the the spirit came on you that's not it that's not it i think that's important for us to realize the second event we have to discover and kind of kind of dwell in it and dig deeper in it is jesus was empowered by the holy spirit jesus was empowered by the holy spirit we lose sight of that when we're reading the gospels that he was under the empowerment of the holy spirit in mark chapter 1 verse 10 again it says as jesus came out of the water he saw the heavens spinning apart and the holy spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and, and you bring me great joy. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. Jesus is being empowered by the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity. This, you know, Jesus is doing it. Why is this a big deal? It's because Jesus set aside. It's going to be really important. Listen, listen. Jesus set aside his divinity he set it aside. We see that Paul talked to, talking to the Philippians. You know, he sets it aside, at least aspects of his divinity. He sets it aside to live a perfect human existence without sin. That's why it's important. Jesus is the perfect son of God, per, son of man. He is perfect in every way. He he does not have the sinful nature. He has no sin in him. And, and, and because of that, because he does empty himself of certain uh, prerogatives that he would have as God, when he is working out a miracle, it's under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that is working, doing the miracle. Maybe thinking, well, really? I don't know about that. You know, I don't know, Pastor Jesse. Well, in, in Mark chapter 3, verse 22, we see something really important that we tend to miss out from that passage. It says, but the teachers of the religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, when they look at Jesus, they're saying, you know where he's getting his empowerment? Demons. I want you to notice how Jesus responds back. That's really important, how Jesus responds to that accusation that his power is coming from demons. Verse 28, it says, I tell you the truth. All sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the, what? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. He doesn't say anybody who blasphemes the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah, anybody who blasphemes me. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that's empowering his work. The miracles, the preaching, the authority he brings to cast out demons. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so he addresses that as blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so he calls it. We'll never be forgiven. We'll talk more about that next time, though, in a couple of weeks when we get to chapter 3. 
this is a sin with eternal consequences. What does that mean? Well, you have to wait until a couple of weeks from now. Uh, so I can't give you all the goods in one, one sitting. Uh, you'll be too full. You see, the evidence that Jesus, the evidence, well, by the way, you, you can't lose your, your salvation. I'll put you that to relieve some of your souls right, right now. But we'll talk more in the next couple of weeks. The evidence that he was the son of God was not the miracles. The fact that he did all these miracles, that he, all these demons were being cast out, that's not the evidence that he is the Son of God. The evidence that he is the Son of God is the death and resurrection. The resurrection is the cornerstone of what proves that he is the Son of God. And his life was guided by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that you and I have. It's the same Holy Spirit that you and I have in our lives. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus is talking. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now. He's referred to the fact that the Holy Spirit is working through him. He's living, you know, there with them. And later will be in you. He says, you're going to have this Holy Spirit in you. You don't have it yet, but you're going to have it. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have this. It's going to change your heart. It's going to be radically different. It's going to give you a, a propensity now towards God, but he's not, he's not going to totally erase your sinful nature. In verse uh, 5, verse 18 of, of Ephesians, it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, be empowered or be influenced. He contrasts uh, the being filled with alcohol. Because when you have alcohol, for those of you who've, who've partaken, uh, you get a little crazy. You know, not crazy, but you get, you're get under the influence, right? You do things, say things that maybe you wouldn't before. When you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you say things, you do things you wouldn't do before. Because you're, you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So what's the difference? What's the difference? Why aren't you putting your hand out and miracles are happening? Why, why are you not able to do what Jesus is doing? Maybe in occasions that will happen, but for the most part, why is it that although you have the Holy Spirit, you can't seem to hear him all the time just like Jesus did? That he doesn't seem to lead you in a way that he led Jesus. You know what the difference is? It's called sinful nature. You and I have static in the line. That's why. Remember those old phones, you know? You're talking with someone. You're on the road. You're like, yeah, can you hear me now? You know, you remember that old commercial? There's static in the line. Well, you and I have static in the line. And that static is caused either by our own uh, willful, rebellious sinfulness or just by the very fact that we have, we have a sinful nature. And so there's this static on the line. That is why, that is why it is very, very important, folks. Very important. If you're here and watching online, this is very, very important. That is why you always put these inward kind of promptings in check with the Holy, with, with the Holy Bible, with, a, with the Scriptures, and with wise counsel. Because sometimes when you're having these, man, I think Jesus is doing this, and I think Jesus is doing me to do, wants me to do this, sometimes that's the fajita of the night that you ate, you know, the bad enchiladas of the night or the bad tacos or whatever. They're talking to you, and you wanted to do stuff. You need to put those to the test. What does Scripture say? Because he doesn't lead you to do, do sin. And so many times I hear people say, well, the Holy Spirit, I fell in love. The Spirit just made me go, you know, with him. And I'm sure I have a wife, but, you know, like, wait, wait a minute. Don't attribute something to the Holy Spirit that was your own internal. That's why we got to, we got to put it in check. That's why we were like, okay, would God, would God do this? Would the Scriptures say, would, would the Scriptures endorse this? Would the wise counsel say, yeah, it's okay? If not, it may not be the Holy Spirit. That's why we're very careful. But, but many of us, I suspect, are not even listening to begin with. And God's talking. Wanting to move, lead you to engage somebody with the word or engage somebody with the, with the good news. And you're like, mm, I don't want to do that. Mm -mm. Folks, you're missing out. Because Jesus was compelled by the Holy Spirit. What he said was moved by the Holy Spirit. What he did was moved by the Holy Spirit. 
And sure, we're not going to be like Jesus, like we can just say, bada bim, bada boom, you're healed, you know. He showed up, bam, miracle happened. But we, but we miss out because a lot, oftentimes what we don't do is we don't press in to hear his subtle, quiet voice when he says, uh-uh-uh. Like, mm, wouldn't do that. Wouldn't do that, right? Or you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta talk with that person. And we miss out. We miss out so many times. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is not a power uh, to connect to. It's not like you, you're like a vacuum cleaner, you're connected, you know, and boom, you got power. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is, a, is a person. It's not this power that you, somehow you're gonna wield this power, right? Like a magician or like a like a I don't know, like a wizard or something. You're gonna wield this power, you're gonna channel that power and do something with it. I don't know why this. This is more like Tekken, you know, a Yukon, you know, like Street Fighter game. You know, it's like you're trying to wield some power, like you're a conduit of his, you know, you're trying to access to that power. No, he's a person in you. And he works when he wants to work, by the way. He works when he wants to work. There's, in the future, we're going to look at a passage where Jesus goes to his hometown. And in his hometown, of all places, people that are familiar with him, people that are like, isn't this Jesus, the son of Mary? In other words, like, like really, virgin birth? We're going to see that in a couple of weeks, though. Well, what happens to him? He's not able to do a lot of miracles. He lays on hand with uh, a couple of people, and then that's it. No miracles. And he is like, man, what happened? He's like, he's, he's like, they're in their disbelief. They couldn't, they couldn't receive a miracle. Well, guess why, too? Because the Holy Spirit dictates that. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit works when he wants to work. If he wants to use you to heal someone, he's going to do it. If it's not the time, he's not going to do it. He dictates the terms. The, sec- the third event is this, and that is Jesus was tested by Satan. Jesus was tested by Satan. In the other Gospels, they get more elaborate on what happens, but Mark just kind of, boom, hits it, and he moves on. So we're going to slow it down. We're going to slow it down. Again, in verse 12, it says, The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. Pause here for just a moment. How many years was Israel caught in the wilderness? Anybody? 40 years. It's 40 years caught in the wilderness. When they rejected God, after coming out of Egypt, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. And here Jesus, being the supreme example of what Israel should be doing, he's being tempted for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. What does the angels took care of him mean? Let me tell you something. I don't know. I don't know. I know that uh, we have ministering spirits to us. What that looks like, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure. But he's, they're, they're ministering to him. They're helping him out. They're taking care of him. And, and this is why this is so important. Because that's his first assignment. And in this first assignment, he is, is an assignment of temptation. And he passes that assignment. Now, if you recall back to Genesis chapter 3, who failed the temptation test? Adam did. And Adam became our father. He became the first of us. And Adam, because of his sin and rebelliousness, what happened is that we were all born, are all born with a sinful nature. All the descendants of Adam, because of his sin, are born with a sinful nature and a cursed world. So when he's with the wild animals, the wild animals don't attack him because he is the son of God. Now, you have to confess, like there's something in you that says, yeah, that's true. We, we have this innate sinful nature in us. Like we, when you, for those of you who have little children or at some point had little children, you didn't have to teach your child to talk back, did you? Right? They just talk back. And it wasn't, for the most part, it wasn't because they saw you talk back to your loved one. It's that you just naturally just blah, blah, blah. You know, you're like, man, I could, you know, the pitch orange starts coming out. You know, you're like, oh, yeah. You know, if I brought you to this world, I can take you out of this world, right? Or, you know, like growing up, it was like, you didn't teach him to hide the candies underneath the bed, the chocolates. 
And, and you go to the kitchen, and yeah, this is life experience, actually. You go to the kitchen, and you're like, man, there's a lot of Snickers missing here. Where, where did they go? I didn't eat them all. And you go to the room, and, you know, they might have a little, they have brown in their face. You know, you're like, okay. You know, it doesn't take a detective to start realizing, like, that looks like chocolate on their face, you know. And then you look underneath the bed, and it's like there's all these wrap, wrappings of chocolate. And, and you didn't teach them how to lie when you said, have you been eating chocolate? No. Uh-uh. The wrappers are underneath their bed. I don't know how they got there. Did you teach them to be so elaborate and be like, oh, you know, I'm gonna, this is the way you lie to someone? No. Why? Because they were born, we were born with this sinful nature, the same sinful nature that causes static in our life, the same sinful nature that Jesus addresses with the baptism of the Holy Spirit when he changes, changes our heart to long for him now. In, in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 15, verse 45, <coughs> it says, um, the scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a living, giving spirit. In other words, Jesus is the second Adam. And he passes the test. And because he passes the test, he's able to give us life. And because he passes the test, he's able to hang in that cross and take the punishment that you and I so rightly deserve. Why? Because he passed the test. And he continues to pass the test. And he continues to obey and obey and obey and obey. Why? Because he has no sin in him. He is fully man, just as, like he is fully God. Those two things are important. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that, so that he would be our merciful and faithful priest before God. He was made just like us so he could be our priest, the one that goes on our behalf before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. He could offer himself as the perfect human being and say, I am perfect. I passed the test. I will be the perfect sacrifice. You won't have to kill lambs. You won't have to do all that anymore once a year. Listen, I am the perfect sacrifice. I will take it for you. Why? Because he is perfect. He can do that in a way that nobody else could. He could sacrifice himself. He could take it for us. Then he himself has, has gone through suffering and testing. He is able to help us when we are being tested. Not only that, the added bonus is that he is able to understand when we're being tested and tempted. Hebrews 4.15, it says, The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He knows what you're struggling with more even than you understand it yourself. He understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not what? He did not sin. Yes, he got tested, but he did not sin. He got tempted. The temptation came his way, but he did not sin. Now, when I look at the wilderness, I think about three common temptations that we get that he got. And the first one is this. Who will you trust in a crisis? Who will you trust in a crisis? We all have to admit, like, if you're... If, like, if you don't eat for a day, I don't know about you. I, actually, I should speak for myself. If I don't eat for a day, man, do I get groggy. Woo-wee. Irritable, man, you haven't seen irritable. Hangry, man, you bet hangry. Like, I'm like, I get, like, if you anything you put in front of me after I haven't eaten for 24 hours, I'm going to eat it. I'm going to be like a vacuum cleaner. It's going to be gone, you know, cookies, chips. You know, forget the good, the, the nutritious food. Just eat all the, the junk food. You're just going to eat and absorb, you know, because you're hungry. You know, your, your, your body is in a crisis. He wants to feed it. So Jesus goes for 40 days, for 40 days. And in a moment of crisis, Satan comes before him and says, hey, you can turn that stone into bread. Go ahead. You can do that. And Jesus responds like, hey, I will live by the bread, which is the word of God. And it doesn't, doesn't take the bait. But oftentimes we take the bait in the crisis, don't we? The other one is that what will you do to speed up the process? What will you do to speed up the process? You know, the enemy takes Jesus to the highest place in the temple and he says, man, all, you know, if you jump, the angels will capture you. You're not going to die and everybody's going to know you're the Messiah. Hey, let's just do a shortcut here right, right here and now, man. 
day one of your ministry, you're 30 year old, why wait three years from now? Go ahead and jump. People are going to know you're the Messiah. Do the shortcut. It looks good. How many times do we do that? You want to speed up the process, man. It, the, God's timetable, God's recovery room, God's waiting room is just way too long. Well, at least it feels that way, doesn't it? He had that temptation, but he didn't take it. He didn't take it. And then what will you do to avoid pain? What will you do to avoid pain? Jesus, knowing what's to come, that he's going to be out on the cross, saying, takes him to the highest mountains and says, man, look at this, all the kingdoms of the world. Look at all of this. You can have it all. Come on. You can have it all. I'll give it to you. They're mine. Because Satan does have realm in this world right now. He says, I can give you everything. One little thing in the uh, contract, though. Like, do you worship me? Right? What will you do in your pain? Jesus says, thanks, but no thanks. No, thank you. No, he doesn't take it. Take it. There's always a godless shortcut to get out of pain. You want to know what you're really going to do, what's really inside of you? Get into a, you, I said you didn't even have to get to it. When you're in pain, it's like that's when we see our true colors, right? When we're sick or somebody dies or something happens, you know, and you're in that pressure point of pain. And it's like, ah, oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? We all get tempted. We all get tested that way. So let's take a closer look this morning. At three life lessons. The first one is this. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to sin. Does that make sense? It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to sin. And Satan has you right there in his hand. When you begin to believe that your temptation is a sin. When it's just a temptation. Because what happens when we think that when we're tempted that it's a sin, we give ourselves into that temptation, right? Like, well, I already, I already messed it up, so might as well go all in. It's like, no, Bubba, you didn't mess it up. You're getting tempted. We all get tempted. Jesus got tempted. Jesus got tested. It's all right. Sin is sin. It's when you sin, that's the sin. There's different types of temptations, aren't there? There's the inside-out temptation, the flesh, you know, the, like the Bible calls it, you know. If it's inside-out temptation, run away from it. Run away. You know, those fleshly desires, you want to do what is wrong, you know, in the, in the face of right, you want to do what is wrong. It's like, it's like if you're a diabetic and you're like extreme diabetic and you go buy a huge massive cake and you're hoping to eat it that night, guess what? You ain't going to survive past that night. You know why? Because you can't. You can't put yourself in that temptation, right? You know better. If you're lactose intolerant, don't go for the big jug of ice cream. Don't eat it in one sitting. Spare your spouse. Don't do it, right? Because what? Don't put yourself in front of that temptation. In Scripture, we see it very clearly. When you have a temptation that's coming from the inside out, a fleshy temptation, what the eye sees, what the eye craves, avoid it. Run away. But if it's a hardship temptation or testing, dig in and stand firm. If it's a hardship, dig in and stand firm. Our natural tendency when we see hardship it's not to dig in and stand firm. Our natural tendency is to run away. That's our natural tendency, isn't it? Something harsh comes into our life. We're like, I'm going to take plan whatever. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go a different plan. That's our natural response. We do the opposite of, opposite of what is painful, what is hard. And when it's hard, that's when I believe, oftentimes, is when we see Jesus just really pressing in. And that's when we hear most clearly his voice. Because we're like, man, it's hard, but I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to be here because Jesus took it even harder. And I'm going to follow his example, his way, his approach. I'm going to follow his example. I'm going to suck it up, Susie. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be like, yeah, I'm going to suck it up in this. And so you just suck it up, and you're like, okay, God, I'm going to depend on you just like Jesus depended on you, Father. That's what Jesus did when it was tough. Boy, yeah, those are the sweet moments. I'm telling you, those are the sweet moments when, when it is hard, and you're like, man, Jesus is so good. All of a sudden, you start saying stuff like, man, Jesus is so good. People around you are looking at you like, what are you saying? Jesus is so good. You have it so bad. But it's because inside your spirit, the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm here. Jesus loves you. and he's, I'm going to help you through this. Number two, sometimes the center of God's will is in the middle of a desert. Sometimes the center of God's will is in the middle of a desert. Can you imagine Jesus in the midst of 40 days saying, Man, I'm away from the will of God in this. 
No, he was in the center of God's will. For 40 days, he was in the center of God's will, and he's in the midst of a desert. What's your desert? Are you in a desert right now? Because you know what? God is in the, in the center of your desert. He, you may be in the, in the center of God's will, even though it's tough. And even though you're like, man, I can't push forward. You, you listen, you may be right in the center of God's will. Don't, buy, don't shortcut that. Don't leave way too soon. You know, with Jesus, he had obedience the God's favor, the Holy Spirit leading, and that equaled a desert experience. Fascinating. Obedience, God's favor, plus the Holy Spirit equaled a desert experience. So we have to be careful with that because obedience takes us where we need to be, not always where we want to be. Let me say it again because you need to write it down. This, this, I'm telling you, this, you're going to go home. You're going to be like, what did he say? Let me, let me go watch the video again. You're going to be like, oh, he's too long. He went long-winded this time. So let me just say it again so you can write it down. Obedience takes us where we need to be, not always where we want to be. That's what obedience does. You may be in a place where you w- don't want to be, but that's where obedience took you. That's not a bad thing. That is not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Because Jesus is still with you. The Holy Spirit is working inside of you and in your circumstances as well. And lastly, a blessed life is not necessarily an easy life. A blessed life is not necessarily an easy life. Boy, we think it in our heads that a blessed life means that it's going to be easy. And Jesus did not have it easy, folks. At first it looks good. People are listening. But then what happens? He gets sabotaged. People are, are observing to see what he's making, what looks like mistakes, which are not mistakes. And, and they go and sell them out. You see, we've come to believe that that to be blessed means to be riding easy. We didn't even see that in Mary. Remember when the angel comes to Mary and says, Oh, blessed among women. And I wonder if that moment she was thinking, Oh, this is going to be great. Would you look at the life of Mary? Things weren't great, folks. When she's going to Bethlehem, I tell you something, she probably wasn't on that donkey. We think, oh, we have the picture, right? If, if it's been in the picture, we think that's the case, right? We think, oh, she's in the dog. Listen, if she's pregnant, she's waddling. I don't know why I'm doing this part, you know, but she's waddling, right? She's not in a donkey unless she, she have a miscarriage. She's waddling to the next place she needs to be. She doesn't have it easy. There's no room in the inn. She's in poverty. She goes to the temple to worship God, and what does she have? They only have enough money for pigeons, which is what a poor man would give. She's a refugee. She's in scorn and rumors around her. We're going to see that in another chapter where, where they're like, you know, yeah, yeah, this is Jesus, the son of Mary. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, right, you know. No mention of Joseph. What are they saying? Oh, yeah, he's, he's illegitimate, you know. We don't know who the daddy is. She was widowed. We hear of Jesus uh, with Joseph uh, when he was a uh, tween, uh, 12 or 14, you know. But beyond that, we don't hear about Joseph. She was, she was widowed. But she was yes, she was blessed. She watched her son be brutally killed at the cross. You think you would say at that point, oh, how blessed I am. Look at my son. He's been murdered. He is being crucified. He's bleeding to death. He's going to die in just a couple of moments. You think she would be like, oh, how blessed am I? At that moment, I highly suspect that she wasn't thinking, oh, how blessed I am. Although maybe you can make the case that she knows what she stands for and the fact that he's dying to take her very sin as well. Just like the song says, you know, that the son that she delivered is about to deliver her. Blessed? Oh, yeah, you betcha. You betcha he's blessed. But it wasn't easy. I always judge God's goodness by the cross, not by today. Never judge the goodness of God by today, judge it by the cross. And how we stand firm in the victory that comes tomorrow in eternity. Because that's where the victory is. That's the guarantee. That's the promise that the victory will come, will be part of our victory. I don't know where you're at in your journey. But you are blessed. It may not be easy. Let's pray. Lord, Father, we thank you so much that we are carriers of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What you talked about, Jesus, to Nicodemus, when you went to him and said, you know, you you, you can't determine 
where the spirit lands and falls any more that you can determine where the wind comes from. You just feel the effects. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you've uh, touched our heart, Lord, and that, and, and that you're, you're creating these longings and yearnings for your presence and for you, Jesus. And we thank you, Christ our King, that you are our deliverer. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Christ our King. We love you. We 